Okay, so the first mechanism is the modification of already existing structures. And so we have a term for this, which is called homologous. And so homologous means, in terms of macroevolution, it means that homologous structures are structures that have a common evolutionary origin. Okay, so structures with a common evolutionary origin. And oftentimes this also means embryonic because one of the interesting things about the embryo is, is that that early embryonic development is really highly constrained, which means that it hasn't changed much. And so when you look at the embryos of the vertebrates, for example, early embryonic development in a mouse versus a fish versus a human is very, very similar. And then they start to diverge as genes get turned on and turned off and we have the regulation of development. So one that you probably have heard of is homologous structures are the vertebrate limbs. So for example, a human arm versus a flipper, oops, a front flipper, right? Versus a wing. So when we look at our arms, they would be homologous to the flippers of a whale but they would also be hom homologous to the wings of birds. And so this is the modification of the four limb put. So when we look at the, the four limb of all vertebrates, we see that they have the same bones. And so these bones are color coded. So we see that there's one big bone and then there's two bones, these are the radius and the ulna, and then you have a set of bones which are wrist bones, and then these are the bones, the metacarpals um, and the phalanges that make up the hand. And you'll notice that this is the same pattern, one bone, two bones, a bunch of little bones, right? And it has just been modified over time. So one of the really interesting things about this is that um, we seem to have genes that regulate fundamentally the um, early development and the patterns of bodies. And so these are called Hox genes. And Hox genes are regulatory genes. Sometimes they are called master control genes. They don't, um, code for proteins directly, um, but they pr code for um, other molecules that then subsequently turn on other genes. And so these are developmental genes. And one of the really interesting things is, is that we have Hox genes that are also homologous. So one gene that is important in the development of the fingers has a really funny name, and they named it after um, the fruit fly, when they uh, mutated the gene in the fruit fly, because fruit flies also have this gene, they, um, they looked like this. And so this is called the sonic, so this is an example of a Hox gene. This is called the sonic hedgehog gene. And it is an example of a Hox gene. It's sometimes abbreviated as SHH, the sonic hedgehog gene. And this regulates, they believe, it regulates the development of the limbs, specifically the fingers, and it also regulates um, the development of the nervous system. So the same genes 
are found in humans, cats, whales, and bats. And interestingly enough, they're also found in almost all of the animals. So the sonic hedgehog gene is also found in fruit flies. But what it does is it codes for and regulates the development of the appendages of the fingers on the limbs, fingers and toes. And so that is an example of um, a gene. And this gene is highly constrained. So it means that it hasn't changed much over evolutionary time. And it can kind of explain and kind of show our interrelatedness that we share so many of the, of the genes. Like for example, humans and mice share about 85% of our DNA is identical. And it's because of these master control genes that then turn on other genes that then cause um, certain limbs to develop, okay? Another one that I wanted to talk about, another example of a master control gene is what is called Pax6. And that's not as interesting as the sonic hedgehog, but Pax6 gene, and this regulates the development of eyes. And it's believed to regulate the development of eyes in all mammals, or excuse me, all animals. Right, so our eye development, the development of a mouse eye, the development of a fruit fly eye, even the development of these little eyes on um, invertebrates like um, little sea star eyes, or there's some cnidarians that have little eyes that can detect light and dark. So we find that this Pax6 gene is found in all animals that have eyes. And um, when we look at it, we can see, oops, I forgot, skip ahead. We can see that mutations in this gene um, um, can lead to, um, uh, imperfect eyes being formed. So for example, this is what is called wild type. And so when you see a wild type gene, that is the one that is normally found in the population. So in the wild type, the eye just normally forms, right? So we have human, mouse, zebrafish, and drosophila. All have the same gene that controls for the formation of eye. When you get a mutation, um, then it can cause um, the cornea to become opaque and you lose the iris, right? And then we can see that mutations that, you know, same mutations cause a change in mice, zebrafish, or drosophila. So understanding, for example, um, how this gene works in a drosophila can actually help us um, treat human disease by understanding how this gene regulates the development of the eye. So it's a really cool thing that we share all these genes with the other animals in the um, animal kingdom. Okay, so I did want to talk about the Evo Devo, which um, is um, a new area of study which is called evolutionary development. So um, you can take classes in Evo Devo, or you could become a professor in this, right? And what this is doing, just like I talked with the about the Hox genes, this would be also the people who study Hox genes would be um, studying evolutionary development. And so when we um, look at an example of this, we can look at it in the Galapagos finches. Galapo, oops, Galapagos. There's ghosts, sorry, there's A's in there, finches. You probably have heard the Galapagos finches. This is an example of divergent evolution. So instead of convergent, we have a common ancestor and the Galapagos Islands um, are um, made from um, volcanic um, activity and so you can imagine that they're younger than the mainland and so they were formed and then birds from the mainland of Ecuador probably um, found their way to the island and then they took up residence on them. So the common ancestor gave rise to many different groups. 
So if we go back and we look at this, we can see here that there's a common ancestor and you can look at the shape of its beak, right? And we can see that it gave rise to some species that have a very thin beak, which probably um, feed upon insects. Some that have very big beaks, which are probably feeding upon nuts, for example, right? And so when we look at them, the beak has changed in size and length. And so this is an example of divergent evolution where these are all directly related to one another because of the presence of a common ancestor. Now, when we look at um, Evo Devo in here, what they found with the Galapagos finches is, is that the same genes, set of genes, control genes, same genes, um, code for the for all the different beaks. There's not a new gene that codes for a seed eating beak versus a um, insect eating beak. Right. So there was no new genes. There was no new um, genes that had to be created. But what happens is, is that the genes are turned on and off at different times. And this determines the difference in the adult beak. So it's the regulation of the genes and when they, the timing of their um, turning on and turning off that determines all the differences that we see, right, in the beaks. Okay. So we would say that a beak, for example, is these beaks are homologous, right? So they have the same evolutionary origin. So they are homologous but they are also analogous. So I wanted to distinguish between these two terms. So this would be same evolutionary origin. Analogous means same function, right? So in this case, it would be, for example, feeding, right? So they use their beak to feed, right? Maybe you would say, well, one uses it to crack seeds where one uses it to probe and underneath bark to get insects, but it's all feeding, right? So the same function. Now, when we look at some traits, they are um, homologous, but not analogous, right? So if we look at um, a um, flipper of a whale versus a um, wing of a bird, These are homologous, but not analogous. Okay, so the same embryonic origin. But if we look at, say, for example, the wing of a butterfly versus a wing of a bird, these would be analogous but they're definitely not homologous. And the reason why is when we look at insects, like butterflies, they do not, oops, they do not use one of their, um, oops, stop, I don't wanna stop broadcasting, just a second. There we go, right? So butterflies have six legs, just like say, for example, um, what would be an ant, right? But they have a wing. And so the wings are not modified appendages. The wings are actually extensions of their exoskeleton that come out the back of their body. And so that is very different than modifying a leg to become a wing. And so that's why the wing of a butterfly and a wing of a bird would be analogous because it allows them to fly but it would not be homologous because it, um, they, excuse me, 
would be analogous, but they're not homologous because they have different embryonic origins, different evolutionary origins. Okay. So one of the interesting things is, is that you can actually turn on the Pax6 gene in different parts of an organism's body. So here you can see that they turned on the gene in the antennae, and the fruit fly developed a second eye. It's not functional, but it looks like an eye. And then they can also um, produce fruit flies that have eyes on their legs and other parts of their body. These are actually not wired properly, but they appear as eyes. And so that allows us, when we turn on these genes in different areas, you can get the, the, um, uh, the structure that the gene regulates the production of um, from be, or being produced. Okay, so that's an example of a Hox gene, a gene that regulates development. It's a master control gene, and it is homologous. It's the same in all um, of the creatures. So we would say that eyes are in all animals are homologous because they um, um, have the same gene that regulates their development. So eyes seem to have evolved once and not multiple times, and that's the idea of parsimony. Okay, so the modification of existing structures, like I mentioned before, um, is a mechanism of macroevolution. The second mechanism of macroevolution is what is called pedomorphosis, and this has another name that you'll see um, in the literature, which is called neoteny. So these two things are generally synonymous. And what this, the definition of this is the retention of juvenile traits in the adult. So that can actually give you lots of variation if we retain juvenile traits. So an example of this one, which is really interesting, I think, is in sharks, right? They have not a bony skeleton, but their skeleton is made of cartilage. And our embryonic skeleton is made of cartilage. So they retain the embryonic skeleton made of cartilage. It's kind of interesting, but we think that sharks actually evolved from a bony fish and then subsequently lost bones just by retaining their, um, their cartilaginous skeleton. Another good example of this is the retention of gills in some amphibians. So if you think about a frog, the larval stage, the tadpole stage has gills and then they metamorphose and they lose their gills and they develop lungs and they also use their skin to breathe, right? But um, we can retain the gills in some amphibians. So this would be like a newt. So newts tend to be aquatic and they tend to have um, gills and they also have a tail as the adult. So they do not lose those juvenile characteristics. And then if we look at um, humans, we actually think that humans are a product of pedomorphosis and neoteny as compared to the other primates. So when we look at humans, we have a more juvenile skull, like a smaller jaw, okay? And we also are hairless. So those are believed to be examples of neoteny. So if we look at um, an image of that, this isn't in your book, but this is kind of interesting. Look at the, chimp the chimpanzee um, uh, versus the adult skull. And you notice that the adult, the jaw becomes much bigger than the cranium. But look at this. This looks very similar to our um, early, um, early um, skull. And then notice how our skull, look at these, these two look so similar. 
But then notice how our skull um, doesn't change all that much compared to the chimpanzee skull. So we have retained some juvenile characteristics here, and that could be um, an explanation for um, a, a major um, evolutionary event. So this is an example of a newt. Um, I believe this is a New Mexico or Mexican newt, endangered newt. But this is an example where they've retained their gills. This is an adult. And notice how they have the tail. So they swim around in the water and they breed in the water and they never metamor metamorphose into a terrestrial organism. So you can see how perhaps these guys um, evolved after the amphibians that went on to land, right? Left the water and went on to land. And so they retain their juvenile characteristics so that they can live in the water. Okay, so the third mechanism of macroevolution is the acquisition of a foreign trait. And this is a very new idea. The idea here is, is that foreign means that it is not inherited, right? So not inherited directly from an ancestor. And there's um, kind of some evidence that suggests that um, this is a very common form of macroevolution. Early, early on in the evolution of cells, you might have heard this before, we have what is called um, the endosymbiotic theory for the evolution of eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells are cells that have a nucleus. And eukaryotic cells are believed to have evolved from prokaryotic cells that lack a nucleus. And so endo means inside, and symbiotic means living inside. And so there's two structures in the eukaryotic cells um, that are believed to have been acquired um, through this living inside. And um, the mitochondria is one of them. Mitochondria are little structures inside the cell that have their own genet genetic material and can actually reproduce inside of our cells. So the mitochondria is found in all organisms that are eukaryotic, but then we also have chloroplasts and chloroplasts are only found in plants and these are the the organelles that are capable of photosynthesis so they're capable of using light energy to produce sugars so um, these were once thought so they were once separate organisms they're bacteria like they have DNA that's very much like bacteria, and they became incorporated into the larger eukaryotic cell. So there's a, um, if you, like um, Google this, you would come up with an image um, and it looks something like this, right? So this is our ancestral cell and notice it doesn't have any mitochondria or in, in this case of plant cells, chloroplasts. And then what happened is, is that they just incorporated them in and now we have mitochondria, now we have chlor uh, chloroplasts. And so we see that we have the eukaryotic cell. So really early on, the acquisition of the foreign um, my, our little organisms, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, were really important to the evolution of cells. Now, you might not understand this too much if you didn't take Biology 211, so I'm going to give you another example. And actually, I'll give you many examples as we go through the quarter. But another example that might be more understandable 
would be in the stingless jellyfish. And my starboard's not responding, so let's see if I can wait just a second. Try flipping a page here. Okay, so in the stingless jellyfish, So jellyfish are cnidarians, like the hydra we looked at in lab. And so generally, they are carnivorous. So most majority, vast majority, right? Most jellyfish are carnivorous. Okay. They hunt their prey and paralyze them. with stinging cells. Okay. However, there is an inland lake, and there's an inland lake in Palau. So that is Indonesia. So an inland lake in Palau okay, has jellyfish. that are not carnivorous, but rather that are photosynthetic. So most animals obviously are not photosynthetic and they do not get their energy from um, the sun. Um, rather, they get their energy from eating other animals. But these jellyfish are, and they have incorporated algae directly into their tissues. So they are green. And they benefit the algae because they swim up to the surface at, at, during the day and then they go down at night to avoid predation. And they kind of turn so that the, all the algae in the jellyfish get a sufficient amount of light. And then the algae um, provide the jellyfish with energy. They divide, provide the jellyfish directly with sugar. So the jellyfish do not have to be, do not have to have stinging cells and have subsequently lost their stinging cells. So the thing about this jellyfish lake, it's called the jellyfish lake, is that everybody wants to swim there because you can swim with jellyfish and not be stung by them. So if you go to Palau, you have to get on a big, a uh, year, you know, long, maybe multi-year wait list because they only allow certain number of individuals to swim in the lake every year, okay? So this idea of acquiring a foreign trait, right? Acquiring the ability to become photosynthetic. The ancestors to the stingless jellyfish did not have the ability to uh, photosynthesize, but they acquired it by acquiring algae. And so that is another example of an acquisition of a foreign trait. Okay, so just in review, you need to know the three mechanisms of macroevolution, modification of already existing structures, um, patamorphosis or neoteny, and then acquisition of foreign traits. And you need to be able to give examples of those, how those work. Okay, so that is it for macroevolution.